Perfect. So good evening. Thank you everybody for coming. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Tracy, the founder of BRCA Strong. We are here to help women and advocate, support, empower and inspire survivors, survivors and thrivers to eliminate the feeling of isolation and help you feel whole again. During COVID-19, we are sending out packages to women who are going in for mastectomies or are starting treatments. We would like to send you a care package. So if you or somebody you know in your family need this, please contact myself or Kate, one of our board members to go ahead and get this shipped to you. We would like to thank Dr. Alexia for coming on today. I know personally, I'm super excited to learn more information about infectious disease because I know the time that I had to see an infectious disease doctor and was petrified out of my life and know that infections are scary to us. So I look forward to your presentation and ways to boost our immune system. I'm really honored to have you on this call tonight, not only as an infectious disease doctor, but somebody who's a survivor and has walked the walk, you know, with some of these other women and can relate and just show your strength and your power as I see it through Kate showed me your Instagram page and follow you and just watch your stories. We're super thankful and grateful to have you on here tonight. Thank you so much um, for the invite. I, um, I'll tell you guys my story, but before I even get into it, um, what having breast cancer has shown to me is that I am here for more than just the folks that I take care of within the four, four walls of my office. And before I got sick, I was actually feeling um, not wholly dissatisfied with my life and my career. I just felt like this nudge to do something different. And I had it that, you know, I was supposed to help single moms who were going through and experiencing um, breakup or loss of their relationship, loss of their life as they had previously known it and mourning the life that they previously had. And then boom, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and in many ways, being a physician has helped me through um, my breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And I've just been super passionate and purposeful about sharing um, my, not only my patient experience, but just sharing the knowledge that I have as a physician um, to help women who are experiencing breast cancer and other cancers, because there's a lot of overlap. But of course, as a breast cancer survivor, thriver, I'm partial to our community. So who am I? I'm Dr. Alexia. As was mentioned, I'm a triple board certified infectious disease physician. Um, I'm also a mom, a speaker, an author, and a coach, and breast cancer survivor, thriver. So I was diagnosed with stage three invasive lobular carcinoma at the age of 37. My, uh, the bulk of my cancer was in my right breast and in my right lymph nodes. Um, but when I had my mastectomy, they found that there was also breast cancer on the left side that had escaped imaging. So I am one of those people where if something can go wrong, it does go wrong. So my breast cancer was not picked up on a mammogram or a breast ultrasound. Um, even though my tumor was nine centimeters in size, my lymph nodes did not show up in any of my imaging, including the MRI that um, confirmed the presence of a mass before my biopsy confirmed that it was um, breast cancer. So I had nine out of my 15 lymph nodes that were positive for cancer and there was nothing was picked up in my lymph nodes on imaging. Um, so my story is strange in that regard. And also, even in spite of being a healthcare provider and being taken care of by um, people within the healthcare system that I work for, there still were some things about my care that um, make me say, hmm. And so, um, those things cause me to advocate for other women so that other women feel empowered to go advocate for themselves when they talk to healthcare providers. Um, one of the things that Wendy said is she trusts her healthcare providers, she trusts her team, and we all want people to trust their healthcare providers. Um, but we don't want there to be blind trust. So we need to have some level of awareness, even if we don't fully understand our diagnoses so that we can be empowered to do the things that we need to do to um, help ourselves along the way and to advocate um, and speak up when things don't feel right, don't seem right, or when we feel like we don't have sufficient answers or if we feel like we're being overlooked. So I um, 
when I was diagnosed two years ago, I underwent bilateral mastectomies. I had a right axillary lymph node dissection. I chose to undergo breast reconstruction. So I um, had stage reconstruction. So I had tissue expanders in place initially, went through my chemo, my radiation therapy, and then I think waited about six months before having my implant exchange. And actually just on Monday, um, I, last week Monday, I had fat grafting um, because I was not satisfied with um, the outcome of my reconstructive surgery. So um, one thing I will say is don't be bashful like about um, undergoing other surgeries. You know, we don't necessarily want to go crazy about it and we're not going to have our old bodies back and there's a risk every time we undergo anesthesia. Um, but I was so bashful about saying to my plastic surgeon because I was worried about offending her or insulting her or something um, about saying outright, I'm not happy with this outcome and what else can we do? And she was like, girl, you're not being vain. I'm, my feelings aren't hurt. And we're here to give you a body that you, you know, that you love and that you're comfortable seeing in the mirror. So um, I just underwent another surgery. And of course, as an infectious disease doctor and someone who treats surgical site infections, from the moment I found out that I had breast cancer and I was going to have to undergo major surgery and multiple surgeries, obviously infection was like always on my mind. And so um, I took steps to um, decrease the risk of getting surgical site infections, but I also took very many missteps and I'll explain that along the way, like what I did that didn't work and what I did that did work and what you guys can, what you guys can do um, when you are planning for surgery, because even if we've had our diagnosis and we've had our primary surgery and treatment, sometimes we have to undergo other surgeries that are either directly related to our cancer and reconstruction or indirectly related to our cancer. And there's lots of helpful information along the way. Some of this is very specific to taking care of the skin and surgical site. And some of it is just specific to taking care of just our total health and wellness, which I'm a big proponent of um, wellness. So when we talk about um, protecting ourselves from infection, one of the things that we wanna do is try to live a lifestyle that shores up our immune system. The way that we, you know, reach for the emergency or start taking vitamin C and zinc and echinacea when we get exposed to an illness or infection, that's not going to cut it when we're planning for surgery. So we need to do things that help boost our immune system. So what is our immune system? Well, actually, the first level of our immune system is our skin. It's our biggest organ, and it's our primary um, means of protection from infection. And that's why surgery poses such a risk, because you're cutting right through the very thing that protects all of your internal organs and structures. But our immune system is also made up of things like our white blood cells and antibodies and other factors that um, the immune system produces to help protect us from infections that it either recognizes or doesn't recognize. So um, our immune system is to help fight infections, help prevent infections, um, but our immune system on a day-to-day -day basis is not only fighting outside threats, it's also fighting inside threats. So specific to us as um, cancer patients or survivors or thrivers or previvors is our immune system actually on a day-to-day -day basis is always identifying, cleaning up, and engulfing cancer cells or cells that have malignant potential. So we want to keep our immune system healthy as well just to kind of help decrease our cancer risk where we can, okay? There's no perfect formula for preventing a cancer, and sometimes there's nothing we can do at all to prevent our cancer. Maybe we might stave it off or buy ourselves some time for those some time for those of us who are mutants. So I found out along my cancer journey that I have a PALB2 mutation and an ATM um, gene variant um, that predisposed me to cancer. But maybe I'm making up a story, but I just have it that I got cancer at 37 and not in my 70s like my grandfather did or not in my 50s like my father did just because I lived a very highly stressed and unhealthy lifestyle. But that's just something I take on. I don't choose to say to other people that um, 
and I don't believe that I caused my cancer, but I just know that there's environmental factors that contribute. So um, I did a lot of things that suppress my immune system and I'll point them out along the way. Um, and so I'm committed to just maintaining a life of total health and wellness. Um, and that includes just taking care of my physical body, taking care of myself emotionally and spiritually, um, and doing all the things that help that. And I'll explain and outline how all of those are beneficial. So there definitely will be information in here that you get, ladies are familiar with. So um, when we're talking about immune function and building up our natural defenses, we're talking about dietary lifestyle modifications that can strengthen our immune system or our immune function. So always on my list of things to do, regardless of what I'm doing, whether it's getting enough sleep, um, which I accidentally deleted my get enough sleep slide. So please know that I'm encouraging everybody to get enough rest if they're going in for surgery, but for just your life of total health and wellness in general. But all my things to do list is always to live a life that helps boost my immune function. So what we're talking about today um, is the risk of infection related to surgery, and we're primarily talking about surgical site infections. You can get other infections outside of the site where you're directly being operated on. So for instance, you can end up postoperatively getting things like pneumonia, so infection in your lungs or your lower airways. And breast cancer patients are particularly at risk for that because our chest is in pain, our breast area is in pain. And so we might breathe more shallow than we typically would. We are resting in bed more often than we typically would, laying flat on our back or recumbent or reclined um, on pillows. And that actually causes our lungs to collapse. So when you have had your surgery and you're recovering from your surgery, um, make sure you sit up as much as you can. Try not to just lay flat in bed, even just sitting up on a couch or sitting semi-recumbent in a recliner is better than laying flat on your back. And there's lots of um, products and pillows that are specifically made for women who've had breast surgery um, that can help manage that. Make sure you take deep breaths and you play with the little breathing toy they give you in the hospital. That's called an incentive spirometer. As much as it hurts, it helps keep your lungs expanded, sorry, um, and helps decrease the risk of infection in the lungs or in the airways after surgery. So um, surgeons always talk about wind, water, and wound infections is what they're worried about immediately after surgery. So your wind would be lung infections or pneumonias. The other common site of infection, which is just ger generally very common for women, is the urinary tract. So when we have these long reconstructive procedures, we'll often have um, what they call a Foley catheter or a bladder catheter in place. And as much as it pains us to get out of bed and walk and to get up and down from a bathroom, you do want to have them remove that catheter as quickly and um, as safely as possible and get up and start going to the bathroom and limit things like um, withholding urine, uh, limit things like not drinking enough water so that you don't have to go to the bathroom as often because there's discomfort. I unfortunately was notorious for that as a physician. I just never, I was perpetually dehydrated and I never drank enough water because I didn't have time to go to the bathroom. Um, and so I had recurrent urinary tract infections. And that was something that would have placed me at risk when I was going in for my surgery. And then, so that's water. And then the last thing, which we're mostly gonna focus on today is the wound, right? The actual surgical site, the skin, that has been cut during our surgery. So surgical site infections are a very common cause of healthcare acquired or healthcare associated infections. And the CDC defines a surgical site infection as any infection that is related to an operative procedure that occurs at or near the incision site, so it could be the surrounding skin, within the first 30 days after the procedure or it extends out to 90 days when you're talking about any prosthetic material being implanted. So um, obviously those of us who are getting tissue expanders, getting breast implants, getting um, flaps, even though flaps are native tissue, we use them as like prosthetics. And so um, we are at risk for surgical site infections in the short term and in the very long term. So in terms of 
the odds, like what are the odds of getting a surgical site infection? So surgical site infections account for 38%, so more than a third of infections that are acquired in the hospital. So that includes the ambulatory setting because not all of us get admitted for our surgeries. And the, overall, two to 5% of patients undergoing any surgical procedure even in spite of our best efforts, we'll end up with a surgical site infection. So that's one in 24 patients in the United States. So the image that I have here, um, this is actually a case report. So this is a woman who had um, breast implants and I'm not clear on why she had the breast implants, but you can see her surgical scar. I hope you guys can see my mouth right, um, right there, but she ended up with an implant infection because she got a nipple piercing. So um, one of the things that we want to do even after our surgery is to continue to protect our surgical sites from infection by avoiding things like piercing. Um, many of us get tattoos, um, including nipple tattoos or just other um, tattoos to commemorate where our breasts were prior to surgery, um, or just to enhance or cover up our surgical scars and surgical sites. And that's fine to do, but we want to make sure that it's done um, in under conditions that are sterile. So you want to make sure the person, the tattoo artist, um, is following infection control, wearing clean gloves, prepping your skin properly, um, not dipping from a common inkwell because all of that can also contribute to um, infection of the skin and soft tissue that can extend down to your implant or your tissue expanders or can compromise your flap. Um, and even if you chose not to reconstruct, if you went flat, you can still get skin and soft tissue infections um, and you can still complicate the surgical site. And the problem, the additional problem with infecting um, the surgical site is that the circulation is compromised because of the surgery. It may also be compromised if you have radiation there and increased scar tissue. And because we've had chemotherapy and we're relatively immunocompromised compared to someone who has not. And so healing wounds and getting over infections can take a lot longer for us and can be a more complicated route. So we just wanna be thoughtful and mindful um, when we do other things to enhance our bodies. So we can definitely do take measures and steps to decrease our risk of infection while we are preparing for surgery. So if you're having an emergent surgery, which is pretty rare, um, unless you have like an inflammatory breast cancer or something that has to be operated on in days. Usually we have a couple of um, days, if not a couple of weeks to prepare for our surgery. So one of the things we wanna do is manage existing infections. So, you know, you guys know, I mentioned in the beginning of the story uh, that I did everything wrong before my surgery. I had two weeks, six, I had exactly 16 days from the day I found out I had breast cancer until the day I underwent my surgery. And what did I do? I, a, a normal person, I think, or um, I think a reasonable person would have just said, okay, I'm having surgery in 16 days, stop everything, let me take care of me and get myself together. But I did the exact opposite of that. I extended my work hours for every, um, you know, appointment I had scheduled, every imaging, every scan, pre-op visit, consultation, um, that I missed an hour here, two hours there, four hours there from the office. I added that time back to my schedule on other days. I added it on weekends. I added it on mornings I was off. I added it in evenings, and I went, went crazy taking care of everyone except for me. I ended up with the flu and an upper respiratory infection that I caught from one of my patients because I was so busy taking care of everyone else, I didn't take care of me. So stop, pump your brakes, take a step back and see what you can do to clear your schedule or ease your schedule and lighten your load and take care of yourself so that you can decrease stress and hopefully avoid infections, which is so important right now in the midst of COVID, which isn't going anywhere, but that's at a, on a slide that I'll cover at the end. Um, so manage existing infections. So now, because I caught, caught the flu, 
um, and I was having this surgery, I had to go on treatment for the flu, I had to go on steroids, I had to go on prophylactic antibiotics because my primary care doctor, knowing I was going into surgery in a week, had to do everything that she could to get rid of the active infection that I had, even though it was away from my surgical site, um, because I was having prosthetic material place. We knew that it was likely that I was gonna have tissue expanders put in place. So manage any existing infection and make sure the infection is done. One other thing that is super important is like, um, usually we tell people like, okay, it's just a cold, don't worry about it, it's not a big deal. When you're undergoing surgery and when you're having anesthesia, having a cold, even just your regular old cough and cold virus is a very big deal and you should never undergo anesthesia, even if you have a minor respiratory tract infection. So manage infections, make sure they're gone, and, um, and then make sure you're going into surgery clean and ready to go. So these are just pictures of me like during chemo and post chemo. And I always share what I'm eating because I'm very clear that we should be eating and drinking to our health and wellness. Food is absolutely medicine. And there is a significant risk of surgical site infection in someone who is malnourished. And in the United States, we have a huge problem with malnutrition. And that's because our four food groups are uh, pizza, Chinese food, McDonald's, and any other prepackaged stuff we can get our hands on. We eat a lot of food in this country that is like chemical concoctions dressed up as food. And so even though people may have a normal body weight or maybe overweight or obese, they can still be significantly malnourished if they're not eating whole foods. And malnutrition increases the risk of a surgical site infection sixfold. That's huge, huge, huge risk. So even if it's just, you just found out that you had breast cancer and you don't yet know what's ahead of you, but you, you know that there's a surgery in your future or that there's chemo or radiation in your future, the day you find out, you can decide to make a change in your diet. And I would say consider a plant-based diet. And when I talk about plant-based diet, I don't mean that you have to be a vegan, just that the vegetables, fresh vegetables on your plate should be the predominant, the predominant um, part of your meal and that plants should be like the star of the show. Um, and there's just some examples of diets. So the reason why um, having a plant-based diet or having lots of um, plants and whole foods in your diet is important when you're undergoing surgery is because they're rich in nutrition. Um, they're high in antioxidants, which we know the importance of antioxidants for bust busting up free radicals, which are basically the byproducts of our metabolism um, and processing of food and chemicals that we take in our body that we need to eliminate so that they don't damage our body, damage our cells, and age us prematurely. Um, whole foods and plant-based diets are high in prebiotics. So prebiotic foods are foods that help your gut bacteria thrive. And our gut is a huge part of our immune system. Um, and also plays a huge role in our mental health and wellness. So if you have a healthy gut, you have a healthy immune system. They're high in vitamin C, and we know that vitamin C is a precursor for um, our immune cells, our white cells and our immune function, and they're high in fiber, which is good for our gut health as well. So um, some of the other things that you may not think about that are important when you're going into surgery and why I put high fiber is just for a reminder for me to um, say to you all to manage things like constipation um, and take care of your bowel regularity before you go into the operating room. Because a lot of times being stuck in bed and the pain medications that are used to manage our pain can be very constipating and that can lead to a whole host of complications um, in the post-operative period. So we want our gut to be happy so the rest of us is happy as well. Um, and then when you do consume fats, make sure you're consuming um, healthy fats. So um, lean fats like um, that was just found in salmon and tuna and other fatty fit, uh, fish 
um, plant-based fats like avocado and peanut butter, all of those are great for us. They're high in omega-3s, they're anti-inflammatory, and they help decrease our risk of diabetes and help improve our sugar control. And we'll talk about sugar, but not like in the way that will make you cringe, like when people tell cancer patients they're not allowed to have sugar. Um, so um, take probiotics or you can do prebiotics with fermented foods. So yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, and kombucha. So I drink um, quite a bit of kombucha and I take um, supplements as well for probiotics because we're, all, and we're always exposed to antibiotics, especially if we consume meat and dairy products. Um, Farm-raised animals in this country are always exposed to antibiotics to keep them healthy so that diseases from the animals aren't passed on to us who are consuming them. So we always kind of have a little bit of antibiotic exposure on board and that can disrupt our gut health. It can um, lead to increased risk of um, things like vaginal yeast infections um, and just throw off our normal healthy flora. So probiotics or eat prebiotic foods. And I don't wanna just talk at you ladies. I absolutely wanna talk with you. The way my screen is set up, I can't see the chat. So please, please, please like jump in or Tracy or any of our other moderators. If there's questions that are like relevant to a slide, I don't wanna move on from it. I wanna discuss it. So if um, the participants are putting questions in the chat, please, please, please let's hear them, okay? Okay. I think there's one question. Yes. Me. Nope, she does her overall health and wellness. She likes what you spoke about. Nope, no questions yet. <laughs> okay, all right. But if there are questions, please do bring them on. I don't. I can be very long-winded because I like what I do and what I talk about. Um, but I also want to make sure you guys are getting the information you want and need out of this. Question? Yep. Um, so supplements. Mm hmm before surgery, they always ask that question as well. Yes. What supplements you are using? Mm -hmm. and how, what are the certain ones that you maybe should not take before surgery? Absolutely. Um, so that's a great question. So in terms of supplements, um, if you go too high in omega-3s, like if you're taking them in a pill form or a capsule form, that can actually increase the risk of post-operative bleeding and bruising. And the same is true for like vitamin E supplements um, and a couple of others. So usually when I'm doing a preoperative risk assessment on a patient, I tell them to stop all supplements one week before their surgery. And so that's why the emphasis really should be on taking care of our total health and wellness long before we get these diagnoses. But sometimes it's the cancer that's a wake up call um, but we often have more than one surgery ahead of us. So even if we didn't get to make those changes, the first time we find ourselves on an operating room table, at least we're empowered so that, you know, maybe after the mastectomy or the lumpectomy, when we're going in for an implant exchange or we're going in for the second or third stage of our reconstruction, we're prepared for it. So, um, we want to make long-term changes and then you would stop your supplements one week prior to your surgery so that you make sure you're not taking um, any supplement that increases the risk of bleeding or bruising before your procedure. So when you do see your doctor or your surgeon, even if you think um, it's not important that you're taking a supplement, please tell them everything you're taking, your, your ginkgo, your echinacea, your, your centrum multivitamin, whatever it is, your elderberry, let them know, even if it's not a prescription drug, we need to know what you're on because we need to know if it interacts with other medications that you will be prescribed um, or if there's a risk of bleeding and maybe you forgot to stop it, maybe we need to delay your surgery another day or two or a couple of, uh, maybe a week out or something like that. But absolutely let your healthcare providers know and stop them um, at least seven days before your procedure. You need that week to reverse the effect of those supplements. Um, so when we talk about sugar, I'm, I'm not one of those folks who runs around telling people that um, cancer feet cancer feeds on sugar, um, but we know that sugar does have some 
um, long-term and short-term health implications when it's taken in excess. And when we take in a lot of refined sugar or when we take in um, simple carbs. So like uh, white bread and pasta, white potatoes, rice, things like that, that really quickly convert to sugar in our body. Those increase the inflammation in our body. They lead to rapid weight gain. They're associated with heart disease and diabetes. And excess sugar can suppress the immune system and lead to poor wound healing. So even in the days and weeks leading up to your surgery, you can cut your sugar and do things like um, exercise and change your diet such that it improves your blood sugar levels and helps improve your surgical outcomes by decreasing the risk of surgical site infection and decreasing the risk of poor wound healing. So a couple of questions I see. Ask away. First is what about the abuse of marijuana? Mm -hmm. And how about soy among, among other allergies? How to avoid and navigate? And what about vitamin D and B? Okay. So um, soy, what was the specific question on soy? How about soy among other things, allergies? Okay. How to avoid and navigate? Okay, so um, you'll hear a lot of um, mixed messaging about soy. Is soy okay? Is it bad? Is it neutral? Is it good for you? Um, my personal choice is to avoid soy because it's in everything. If you look at packaged foods, it kind of doesn't matter what it is. You will see that there is so much soy out there. Um, and so I try to limit it because I know I'm ingesting it at times when I do choose to eat packaged food or eat certain snacks or cakes or cookies. Um, I know that there's soy in that. So I personally choose to avoid soy. And the, the messaging that I received from my oncologist was to limit it. I don't have to avoid it like the plague, but it's reasonable to avoid phytoestrogen or plant-based estrogens because they can um, contribute to um, hormonal exposure for those of us who have um, hormone receptor positive breast cancers. So I had um, ERPR positive or estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive breast cancer. And so I'm on hormonal suppressive therapy for 10 years as part of my cancer treatment. And so I personally in my lifestyle aim to decrease that. Um, hormone management is also important when you have surgery. So for instance, I was on tamoxifen before I got diagnosed with cancer as a preventative. Um, and back then I really wasn't cognizant of how much of a role diet and lifestyle played in risk of cancer. Um, so I was advised to stop my tamoxifen because it was associated with an increased risk of cancer. So I stopped it two weeks before my surgery so, because it is it has um, estrogen modulating factors. So apart from supplements, other medications that can increase the risk of other complications of our surgeries need to be um, talked about and need to be addressed with our um, oncologists and our surgeons. Um, so I hope that I answered that. Um, so I would say moderation or little soy. Um, I'm not someone who eats like tofu and things like that, um, but it's just a personal choice. I don't think that there's an absolute right or wrong. I, I don't think that, you know, you have to do things my way or this person's way or that person's way. I think that you have to pick and choose the lifestyle that is most manageable for you when it comes to um, managing your um, health as it relates to your cancer diagnosis, managing your side effects if you have to go through chemo, um, managing your recovery with food and lifestyle after you undergo surgery, and the same would be true for radiation and life beyond cancer. Um, I, there's definitely a slide where I talk about supplements, so I'll get back into the vitamin D and the vitamin B. Then there's, is taking Irish seed good for you? So many benefit, and is this something that could affect your treatment and or surgery? What was the? Irish seed. 
Oh, Iris, Iris Seamoss? Seamoss. Yeah. yeah. Iris Seamoss. So um, I personally don't know enough about CMOS to say how it would impact surgery. I know that it is very nutrient rich, rich and is very high in um, lots of minerals. Um, so it wouldn't be something that I would um, immediately introduce right before my surgery. And for me, my rule when I was going through chemo, like I would take my supplements um, up until the day before my chemo, but I would not take them 72 hours or three days after my chemo because I was concerned that things other than kind of regular schmegular food would possibly interfere with the metabolism of my chemo. I didn't want something to speed up the metabolism of my chemo, and I didn't want something to slow down the metabolism of my chemo because your your liver and your other organs are processing all of this stuff. And in the moment that you're going through chemo, your chemo is kind of the most important thing. It trumps everything other than like food, water, air, et cetera. So for the immediate 20, um, 24 hours before and the 72 hours after, um, and that was after discussion with my oncologist. So I would advise the same. Um, I didn't take any of my supplements. I like drank my tea. I still did like my turmeric, but even that she asked me to limit it. So whereas normally like with my turmeric, I, it's like my Frank's hot sauce. I put it on everything um, around my chemo. I really just limited it to like one dish per day. So definitely um, a very specific conversation to have with your oncologist because it can also vary depending on what... Um, chemos you're having, um, but unlikely that it would be a major problem around the time of surgery. But I would say, other than regular food one week before your surgery, I would just cut everything else. Perfect. And okay. one more question I see. Sure. Um, now I'm interested in why you were on tamoxifen, tamoxifen mm -hmm. for your diagnosis. Did you know about the mutation long before me? I had no idea. Okay, so I didn't find out my mutation status until after my cancer diagnosis. So interestingly enough, without knowing I had a mutation, my primary care doctor, because, well, let me start over. So my cancer diagnosis was two years in the making. So when I was 35, I found a lump in my left breast. I always have done self-breast examinations since, my, since I was 20 years old. Um, I had a fibroadenoma that I found myself in my left breast when I was 21, right before I started med school. And it was like the size of a pebble, like a nerd's candy. But I knew my breast so well that when I did my monthly self-breast exam and I found that little nerd of a candy piece of mass, I knew something was wrong. Um, and I really struggled with getting someone to work it up and diagnosis and tell diagnose it and tell me exactly what it was because I was a young woman, I did not have health insurance and I wasn't taken seriously when I said there's something here in my breast and I don't know what it is. It grew over time, over a year it went from being that little nerd's candy to a pea to a marble. Um, by the time it was a marble and other people could actually feel it, um, I ultimately got a breast ultrasound, was told it was probably a fibroadenoma, that it was benign, it wasn't cancer or precancer, and that we would just monitor it. Um, and it grew to about four to five centimeters and it became painful. And so a year after I initially found it, it was removed surgically. So ever since then, I've always done monthly breast exams. And at the age of 35, I found like a marble sized mass in my left breast. Um, had that image, the imaging was concerning. And my primary care provider advised me to have a biopsy rather than wait three to six months and have repeat imaging. Because that's what I wanted to do because I was so busy working and taking care of other people. I didn't have time to go get a biopsy. So she said, you're a young black woman and you're at very high risk to have um, aggressive breast cancer or to have a really bad outcome. If this is cancer, you can't wait three or six months. You gotta get a biopsy. And so I had a biopsy a week later that showed lobular carcinoma in situ, fibroadenoma, and um, something called ALH, atypical lobular hyperplasia. 
And so um, all of those abnormal cells told um, my breast surgeon and my medical oncologist who I established care with at that point that I was at risk for breast cancer. So I kept getting new lumps, new biopsies. And so I was put on tamoxifen as a means to try to prevent um, breast cancer. Um, but unfortunately, in my case, it didn't work. And lo and behold, it didn't work because I had a, a hell of a lifestyle and a genetic mutation that predisposed me to my breast cancer. So I was on um, tamoxifen sort of as a prophylactic measure. Um, so yeah, my story is crazy. It's all over the place. It just keeps on giving. <laughs> so um, other things that we can do. So if anybody smokes and they're going into surgery, we always, always, always encourage them to quit smoking. Um, smoking is associated with an increased risk of surgical site infections and other infections such as um, poor wound healing, breakdown of the wound, or what we call wound dehiscence. So the wound can just open up sometimes. And the reason that happens in smokers is because when we're actively smoking, um, our blood vessels shrink down, they become scarred and damaged. It decreases oxygen delivery to where we need it, and um, it impacts our blood pressure. Um, and it can also cause damage to the skin and premature um, aging and damage to cells. So when someone smokes, we encourage them to quit smoking before their surgery. So there's lung complications that can occur as a risk of having um, surgery as well as smoking, such as pneumonia and blood clots and smoking cigarettes will only increase that. So in people who stop smoking, so smoking cessation, they reduce the risk of surgical site infections and complications significantly. Oh, where'd my other slide go? Let's see. All right, I think I lost the slide, but um, there's a, there was this study done on a population of Danish patients, smoke, and they were all smokers. And they took half of the people who smoked and helped them quit smoking um, six to eight weeks before they underwent any surgery. And they matched them to people who smoked and they matched them to people who've never smoked. The people who quit smoking, their risk of complications ended up being smack in the middle of the non-smokers and the smokers. And when they further looked at the data, the people who smoked had like a like a, up to a 24 to 36% chance of complications of um, their surgery related to their smoking. And the people who did not smoke only had a 4% chance of complications. The people who they were able to help quit smoking, that risk of having, you know, 24 to 30 something percent chance of complications, including surgical site infections, was brought down to 18% by quitting smoking just a few weeks before their surgery. Sometimes we only have, you know, one or two weeks to prepare people for surgery. And even in that short time frame, we still will encourage patients to quit smoking because we know that there are short-term and long-term benefits. Um, so quit smoking if you do, okay? Um, preparing the skin is something that was so big to me. And even without my surgeons do, um, specifically advising me to do so at the time of my mastectomy, I um, started a cleansing routine with antibacterial soap um, one week prior to my surgical procedure. And now I feel like two years later, it's becoming even more common practice um, for people to 48 hours before their surgery, bathe their skin in an antiseptic soap. So sometimes when you go for your preoperative testing, the um, surgical center will give you the surgical scrubs with chlorhexidine or hibiclens in them. And it's the same material or the same antiseptic solution that the surgeons use when they're scrubbing their hands and prepping for surgery. So what you're doing is just trying, is decreasing the bacterial burden of your skin um, but you can't sterilize your skin. Our skin is not a sterile organ, but many bacteria and yeast and all of that live within our skin and live within our mouth and can be the bugs that cause our surgical site infection. So the cleaner we get our skin, um, the safer we are when we're going into surgery. So 
prepping your skin using antibacterial soap or antiseptic soap 48 hours before your surgery. So antibacterial soap one week before, antiseptic soap the um, day before and the morning of your surgical procedure. And also um, don't forget to not put lotions and oils and things like that on your skin the day you go into the operating room. It's important to just take care of your skin's integrity, take care of your skin health. So hydrate, moisturize your skin um, so that your skin is nice and plump and healthy before you go into the OR, but no lotion or you know oil or any of those things that we bathe and love our skin with on the morning of our, our surgery. And then um, when we're preparing for surgery, please, please, please don't shave your skin. Um, a lot of times, you know, we get all bashful. We, we want to be beautiful going into the operating room. We're worried about who sees us, who sees us looking what kind of way. We don't want to appear that we're unkept and we don't take care of ourselves. So we get all excited, like how we prepare for our pap smears and the doctors don't really care what we have going on down there. Um, and so some people may think, oh, I'm having breast surgery. I'm not going to be able to shave after my surgery. Um, they're going to do lymph node dissection. So let me shave and clean things up. But if, if you're doing hair removal, then use clippers or use like a nair or another depilatory agent and do that days before your surgery. Do not shave with a razor prior to your surgery, because even if you don't have a gross cut in your skin, even just micro cuts and micro injury that can occur from the blades um, can set you up for surgical site infections, as well as if you are someone who buys those seven, eight, ten dollar blades and you reuse them, they will be coated in skin bacteria and you're reapplying that bacteria to the skin that you're now going to have surgery on. So do not shave your surgical site. Um, and my rule for um, razors is just buy like the cheap pack at the dollar store and let it be one and done. So preoperative hair removal can be associated with um, increased risk of surgical site infections if you do it incorrectly. Um, I keep, 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 keep on mentioning total health and wellness. Um, so prehab, right? You can help prepare your body for surgery even if you didn't exercise a day in your life before your surgery. So, you know, you don't have to go to the gym and throw around the heavy bag or do deadlifts, but you can do simple aerobic exercise like jogging, biking, walking briskly, um, or doing like uh, what we call HIIT exercises. So high, um, high intensity interval uh, workouts because that improves your immunity. It decreases <laughs> systemic inflammation. Um, it improves the regeneration of your immune cells. It helps strengthen your body. It'll help open up your lungs. It'll improve your breathing and it'll just improve your general health and wellness as you're planning to go on the operating room table. It also is a great stress reliever and it's so important to minimize stress when we're preparing for surgery. So stress, um, apart from like mental and emotional stress and the feeling of um, overwhelm, stress has actual physical implications. So stress decreases our immune function. Stress ages us prematurely. It um, literally damages our cells and damages our DNA. And there's lots of data and studies on this. And so a body that's completely under stress is going to have basically several insults or several hits and impacts um, as you enter into surgery. So I did everything that was absolutely stressful leading up to my surgery. And my, I was, my body was so exhausted and so wiped out. And because I went onto the operating table absolutely exhausted and dehydrated. Um, my team actually had to stop my surgery and troubleshoot and figure out why is this woman not making urine? We gave her three liters of fluid and she gave us three ounces of urine back. What the heck is going on? Um, and so they had to give me medications to kind of spank my kidneys and make them work. They had to leave my Foley catheter in place to measure my urine output for 24 hours after my surgery. 
and um, it was all a complication of just kind of undue stress that I put my body under. Just, you know, instead of allowing myself to be and process my feelings and prepare myself for surgery, I just kind of threw myself into work. And when I wasn't working, I was running around like a crazy person going to all of my consults and appointments um, to get prepared for the surgery. But I took care of everything and everybody else, but I never stopped to take care of me. So stress reduction needs to be a part of your short-term and your long-term game plan when you're undergoing surgery, as well as when you're undergoing um, cancer treatment and just should be a part of your lifestyle moving forward. So things that you can do to eliminate or alleviate stress, meditation, journaling, um, exercise, um, meditation. And if you don't know how to meditate, then certainly check out some guided meditation. There's lots of free apps that you can do for, um, that you can use to learn how to meditate and alleviate stress and help work out your brain uh, chaos, help alleviate stress and overwhelm and put your body at ease and prepare yourself for going into surgery. And then of course, right now we are in the face of COVID. And so um, my plea is that we, in, in addition to doing all of the things that I just mentioned, that we take other steps and precautions to stay healthy. So avoid COVID, but as well as all, avoid all other germs that we possibly can and avoid other folks who are sick. So right now the world is opening up around us and um, as part of the phase reopening of the country, you know, things that are more high risk are opening up later. So things like public gyms, for instance, will open later on. So even though I mentioned exercising to take care of your total health and wellness, please do it at home. Please do outdoor exercise. Now, like the two weeks before your surgery is not the time to go get a gym membership because germs, uh, yeah, germs live in the gym. Um, there's lots of bacteria, viruses, and even um, fungus and yeast. So things like um, ringworm, people pick up at the gym, people pick up herpes, skin infections at the gym, people pick up staph and MRSA or MRSA at the gym and other bacteria because these are bugs and infections that live on our skin. Um, and we're laying on gym equipment, we're touching it with our hands, um, we're sweating, we're wiping our sweat, we throw our towel on things, pick it up, wipe our face. And so it's very easy to pick up germs and infections at um, a public gym or other commonly used public places. Um, other things that I would avoid if I was going into surgery would be things like hot tubs and saunas, and they should be avoided immediately post-operative because there's lots of bacteria that um, live and thrive in those kinds of environments. Same thing is true for swimming pools. Um, lots of germs and bacteria that can thrive in those environments. So um, in the two weeks before your surgery and even um, the several weeks after and your surgeon will give you hard fast rules about how long to avoid those activities and those places and spaces you need to do that before surgery and after surgery. So as it relates specifically to COVID, I cannot say this enough. Please, please, please continue to remain vigilant. Um, please continue to wear your mask. Please continue to practice good hand hygiene. Please continue to socially distance and keep yourself safe from other folks who may be sick, regardless if they have symptoms or not, because COVID is not something that you want complicating your um, post-operative period, and it's not an infection that you want to have delay your surgery. So when I went in for my fat grafting um, last week, Monday, on Friday, I had to have a COVID nasal swab to make sure that I didn't have COVID and I wasn't going to bring it into the surgical center and expose um, the team of physicians and physician's assistants and nurses and surgical techs and all of the folks who were going to be taking care of me in the operating room. Because if I took out my surgical team, then that means how many other women and men aren't going to get the surgery that they need for the two, four, six, or eight weeks that it takes for my team to recover 
And how long would it take for me to rid myself of the virus and how long would that delay my surgical procedure? So we don't wanna delay our necessary treatments and we don't want to complicate them. One of the things we know about COVID now is that it causes an increased risk for clotting um, and surgery and cancer also increase the risk of having clotting events. So blood clots in the legs or clots that um, can travel to the lungs, what we call PEs or pulmonary embolism. These are things we're always concerned about as well as infection and COVID really dramatically increases that risk. So I actually had um, a patient who came to see me a couple of weeks ago for a skin infection in her leg and she was a breast cancer survivor and she had previously had COVID and I said to her, you got to get ruled out for a clot. And she's like, but I was already ruled out for a clot. And I'm like, well, I get that, but clots can develop at any time. And I'm concerned that you have more than an infection. I think you have a blood clot. And not only did she have a blood clot, she had blood clots throughout the entire venous system in her affected leg. And when she said, well, you know, why do I have a clot in general? But, and also like, why is it so bad? I thought you get them in like one spot, not your whole leg. And I had to say to her, it is because of the, your history of cancer and your COVID on top of that. So we want to be vigilant to avoid that particular virus. So um, somebody asked about supplements. So vitamin um, D Vitamin D is so vital to our general health and well-being. It's important for our heart health. It's important for our immune function. It's important for our bone health, which is um, grossly impacted by um, our cancer treatments to suppress our hormones. We begin to lose bone. And so we have to have adequate vitamin D stores and calcium supplementation to help maintain and improve our bone health and prevent bone loss. Vitamin C and zinc are very important for um, building our immune system as well as building our um, white blood cells that are a major part of our immune system. And someone inquired about vitamin B. So vitamin B12, folate, folic acid, um, those, are all, those are also very important to improving our immune function as well as producing um, white blood cells. So absolutely, those are good supplements to take. But you want to make sure you don't overdose because you can have too much of a good thing. And I hear a question. Yes, two questions. Absolutely. One, um, Judy had surgery a week ago and there mm -hmm. was a drain in. And she said, can she ask, one of her drains isn't working. Mm -hmm. so how do you think it's open? Do you think it's open to an infection? She said, one of them's just not um, clearing out and it's mm -hmm. it, coming out the side instead of through the drain. She is going in for surgery tomorrow. Okay. So when um, we have surgical drains in place, um, they can stop functioning for another number of reasons. So either just the seal is broken, um, which that's what it sounds like. If fluid is draining from the skin and not um, being pulled out into the tube, it could be um, because the it's not a closed vacuum system anymore. Um, and so you're not getting the suction you get from the little bulb. Sometimes the tubing itself can get clogged. So it can get clogged from um, the bloody fluid, might just clog the drain, um, or tissue can get into it and clog the drain. Um, and if it's infected, you should see some signs of infection. So redness surrounding the skin where the drain enters the site, swelling, increasing pain, although it's hard to imagine that those things could get any more painful than they already are because mine were horrible. Um, or you could actually see frank pus draining from the site. Other more subtle signs of infection would be like fevers, night sweats, shedding, like having drenching night sweats, um, shaking chills could be signs of infection. And so um, whenever there's an issue, you always just want to go follow up immediately with your surgeon um, or one of their associates if your surgeon isn't immediately available. She's Unfortunately, having uh -huh. she's having surgery tomorrow again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in the meantime, just um, keep the drain site protected and covered. Um, and then the surgeon will deal with it tomorrow. Two other questions. So sure. should you put off air train and cruising travel the week before surgery? 
absolutely. So pre-COVID, um, I might have been tempted to tell someone, you know, go do something fun or take um, a vacation. And I, I think you can still do like a staycation before your surgery. You can still do things that are um, fun and relaxing to take your mind off your surgery, as well as to kind of treat yourself before you go into recovery mode and you're stuck at home for several weeks and your life revolves around doctor's appointments. But uh, right now in the day and age of COVID, I absolutely would not get on a cruise ship and I would be um, really, 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 really extremely hesitant to get on an airplane, even with a mask and other measures. I would you know, do a short road trip or do some sort of staycation where you plan a bunch of fun activities, but I would try to avoid travel and avoid crowds as much as you can right now, um, leading into your surgery. I have a factor five light in with chronic DVTS. Mm -hmm. so what you just said about COVID, mm -hmm. very, be very bad for me right now. I'm having reconstruction on the 30th. Should mm -hmm. probably for COVID-19 before having yeah. reconstruction again. Yeah. So a lot of surgical centers are screening patients for COVID with the nasal pharyngeal swab, you know, anywhere from two days to one week prior to the surgery. So the best thing that you can do for yourself is just continue to be um, vigilant and stay away from other people. And during a time like this of under any other circumstances before we would say, get all the support you can, um, you know, have a ceremony, a ritual, a party, a celebration, whatever, to say goodbye to your breast, do all the things. You know, we would say go out, celebrate, have a good time, eat the things that you want to eat, have a meal with the people you love. We would say that under any other circumstances. But right now, the stakes are just really too high with COVID. Um, but you can recreate all of those things in virtual space through a Zoom conference. And um, my family and I have done it. We've done it um, for other friends and family members who are going through various circumstances. But I do think that it is important to, um, to like thank your body and thank your breast for what they have done for you and given to you before you undergo um, a mastectomy or reconstructive surgery. I think it's important to capture pictures of them um, I would say write a letter to them and release them, um, acknowledge that you will miss them and that you're sad to let them go and the reasons, like what you're gaining by letting them go. Um, I think it's, for me, it's just a therapy, it was a therapeutic and healing process and I did it before my surgery. And um, interestingly enough, I was having a conversation with a friend and she said to me, she finally wrote a goodbye letter to her breast like just a couple of days ago. And it was two years after she underwent her mastectomy. And she said it was such a relief and she was sad she didn't do it sooner. But sometimes we just don't think of those things. And that's the importance and the value of communities like this and bringing folks together to have conversations like this and to um, talk about what works for other people, what do doesn't work for other people, and take away from it whatever you choose for your own health and your own journey going through breast cancer or um, previving, surviving, thriving, um, because I don't think that it's ever too late to take on some of the lifestyle changes that we can make to improve our lives, improve our, improve our outcomes as it relates to um, having a breast cancer diagnosis or having a risk for breast cancer. Um, so yeah, and so my, I think this is my last slide slide. So um, sex. So sex actually boosts your immune system and um, without being too graphic, I, I remember before I had my mastectomy and talking about undergoing reconstruction, my dad was like, well, why do you have to reconstruct? Why don't you just go flat? Like, you don't have to have extra surgery, you know, unnecessarily. It's more time on the operating room table. And he's like, you, you know, 
Kennedy, my daughter, she was six at the time. He's like, she's six. You're not having more babies. Like, what do you do with your breast anyway? And, you know, I kind of cut my eyes at my dad and I told him things that I was not discussing with him. But, um, you know, our breasts are very much a part of our um, sexual life and sexual function. And so I enjoyed mine before I had my mastectomy. Um, but when I'm talking about a, a life of total health and wellness, part of what I do as an infectious disease doctor is make sure people have a safe and healthy sex life. And there's a lot of benefits to having a safe and healthy sex life. So it's exercise, it burns calories, it relieves stress, it improves sleep. And remember, I said I accidentally deleted my sleep so slide, but you absolutely should be getting adequate sleep leading up to your surgery. People feel like, oh, well, I'm going to be sleep on the operating room table and I hear it's the best sleep you ever had. So I'm just going to live it up and hang out and do all the things before my surgery. No, get some sleep. Okay. And, you know, pre-bedtime sleep, uh, sex will improve your sleep. Um, and again, it improves your immune system, but make sure you have a safe partner. Um, you do not want to uh, pick up sexually transmitted infections heading into your surgery. So um, I'm done and I welcome you ladies to absolutely please ask me any more questions that you have. I thank you all so much for your time and attention. Um, thank you so much for, to um, Brock Strong for having me on um, and allowing me to use my plat your platform, excuse me, to share my story. And I invite you ladies to follow me. I'm um, very active on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of my handles are at Dr. Alexia. And then um, I have a Facebook group that is Breast Cancer Beautiful. And I certainly do invite you to connect with me there. And I'm gonna take down this screen and I would love to hear if you ladies have any other um, questions that I can answer or if you have any questions about my experience as a breast cancer patient um, who happens to be a physician. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everybody. It was super informative. A lot of information I learned and I'm sure a lot of our survivors that were just diagnosed and are going through the struggle. So I appreciate you sharing your story and giving us all those important information really everybody needs you know imperative information on infections and how to avoid it so i'm going to unmute any everybody and if anybody has questions please either speak out or raise your hand judy i see you have a question go ahead um unmute all oh, hold on there you go, go ahead. <laughs> well i was i wasn't going to ask but i will ask now you know um one of the things that is uh, grossly not happening to me right now is sleep mm -hmm. and um, I'm just not I mm -hmm. can't stay asleep if I fall asleep mm -hmm. so I, I, I am getting ambient although even with ambient I'm not necessarily getting more than three hours sleep mm -hmm. it's always been an issue for me it's gotten worse now but so I know it's important, but. Yeah, sometimes it can be truly challenging to get sleep. And a lot of folks are very sleep deprived. Um, and I, a lot of our problems with sleep is all this technology. So uh, your phone shines a blue light into your eyes and it tricks, it confuses your brain. Your brain thinks it's daylight all the time. So um, one of the things to do is to put down your cell phone, iPad, laptop, tablet, all of the things um, a few hours before you go to sleep. And I know that's really hard to do because in our boredom and frustration with not being able to sleep, what we'll often do is reach right over on the nightstand and pick up the phone and start you know, swiping. And the light shining through is very problematic. It disrupts your circadian rhythm. So we're all walking around with a grossly disrupted circadian rhythm. Um, the other thing I tell people is that your bed is only for sleep and sex. Nothing else should be happening in your bed because again, it confuses your brain. And you're, if you sit in your bed and 
you know, work on a laptop or on your phone, your brain thinks, oh, okay, we're in the bed office now and we're supposed to be up processing information and reading and all of this stuff. So you have to start shutting your brain off um, a minimum of an hour, but sometimes two hours before it's time to go to sleep. Um, some people sleep better if they have, if they do exercise. I'm one of those people, if I exercise, I sleep like a champ, but some people when they exercise, their endorphins get going and they're like wired and they can't sleep. So you kind of have to know what kind of person you are as far as exercise goes. And you have to take steps to shut your brain off. So if you're someone who's like an overthinker and you lay down in bed and you start thinking about all the things you didn't get done during the day, all the things you're going to do tomorrow, then it can be helpful to do like a brain dump before you get ready to go to bed. So um, one of the ways I deal with overwhelm is just like writing out my schedule, what I'm going to do the next day. That way I'm not trying to remember what I have to do the next day. Um, and in our lives with a ton of doctor's appointments and physical therapy and remembering to take meds, it's very easy to get into that brain rut of, I'm going down, let me plan my day for tomorrow. Don't do that in bed. Like do a brain dump in a journal or a planner. And the same thing is true for like your emotions. Like if you're someone who, um, when you lay in bed, your mind races and wanders and you start going through all the feels, then meditating and or journaling before bedtime may be helpful for you. And then, um, you know, try to go to bed at the same exact time every day, but don't physically get into the bed until you feel drowsy. Because when you lay in the bed wide awake, that frustration and the anxiety of not falling asleep will actually keep you up even more. It's like this awful self-fulfilling process of not getting any sleep. And then um, have like a very set bedtime routine that you do um, ritually. So your brain knows it's time to go to sleep. So when I am ready to go to sleep, um, I will have a cup of tea usually up in my bedroom and it's um, decaffeinated tea always. Usually I'll do um, like a chamomile tea. You can do lavender tea if that works for you. If I'm like very wound up and I had a terrible day, I'll take um, a bath with um, like lavender in the um, bath salts that I use. Um, I, you can use magnesium as a supplement to help induce sleep. And you can use um, like melatonin, which you can purchase over the counter as a supplement to help induce sleep. Um, but start slow with the melatonin and gradually increase the dose um, because it can make you groggy in the morning if you take too much of it and you don't know how you're gonna respond to it. So start low and then gradually increase the dose. But there's no magic bullet for um, helping to improve sleep, but our lifestyles are so um, anti-sleep. You know, in America, we pride ourselves